All right, so I'm going to begin the, um, the message this morning by reading the commandment again. And the reason I'm reading it is because it's one that we're called upon to remember. And um, like I say, we often forget or we often neglect or maybe we just don't even understand that this commandment is, well, it continues as we, we've already seen along with the other ten that these are the commandments that our Lord writes upon our hearts by His Holy Spirit to give us a love for the, these commandments so that we might walk with God as Jesus did, walk with His, his Father as, as a man on earth. We realize He was more than a man. He's the God-man. But He became fully man to live the life that God calls us to live, to give us an example, but also uh, to give us the power to be able to obey Him. Now, um, uh, so let me go ahead and read this. And then I'm going to review what we have seen so far. And I'm going to review it for my sake. <laughs> and I'm going to review it for your sake. I mean, if I've forgotten it, and I'm the one who's spending all this time with it, I know that we're all struggling to remember these points. Again, if I were to give you a test on that apologetic series that we went through a couple months ago, do you think you'd pass that test? Do I think I would pass that test? We, we looked at a lot of things, so we need to review to try to keep it in the queue, so to speak. Okay, so Exodus 20, verses 18, uh, verses 8 through 11. This is the fourth commandment. The Lord says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now, <clears throat> I do believe virtually everything that we need to know about the Sabbath day is included in that commandment. Some of them are implied and not stated uh, explicitly. But um, uh, one of those is that we are to worship on this day and uh, in keeping it holy, that, that's the idea, keeping it holy. We're going to focus on what that means. Um, but again, let me begin by reviewing what we've seen so far and hopefully it'll at least you know, remind you of what you've heard. Uh, let's see, I think, okay, this is the seventh sermon, so we spent six sermons developing this. I can't obviously repeat everything we've seen, but hopefully we'll hit the highlights. Okay. Now, we've, we've seen so far, at, uh, or at least looked so far, at the fact that we need this day. We need a day of rest. We need a Sabbath because we owe God worship. He's the creator. We're the creature, okay? And worship takes time. And since we are all called to worship Him together, that time, as we've seen, needs to be the same for each one of us. Uh, the author to the Hebrews tells us not to forsake the gathering of ourselves together. Now, we know that in those days, and even in our days, there's a work week that we don't have as much freedom. In those days, they especially didn't because they worked six days a week, and virtually their work took up their entire day. So if they were to gather together, it, it, you know, they would need a special day, and that day would have to be the same for all of them, but that's what the Lord had gave them and what He gives us in the fourth commandment. Now, we saw that God established the Sabbath at the beginning. You know, He worked six days and rested on the seventh. And He gave that day to us because we also needed to rest from our work, which we were originally created to do in the garden to you know, basically cultivate the garden and to guard the garden. That was Adam and Eve's job. But even though it wasn't said, we understand that it was their obligation also to worship Him. So He gave them a day to rest from their labors so that they could worship Him. We saw that this was observed in Cain and Abel at the end of days. They brought their sacrifice. And that it was observed from their day all the way down to when the children of Israel entered into Egypt and Pharaoh essentially didn't allow them that day off. But as soon as the Lord brought them out of Egypt, the first thing He did was to give that Sabbath to them again. And then He took and wrote that in the Ten Commandments, which we understand is the continuing moral law of God and to show us that it was meant to be permanent. It was written by the finger of God on the stone tablets. So this is one of those. 
And then, of course, we also saw in the book of Isaiah, as Isaiah, through the Lord's Spirit, is looking into the future, he reminds us that the Sabbath would continue into the new covenant. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount that the Sabbath would continue as long as the present heavens and earth continued, because as long as they do, there is going to be a need for a day like this, a day when we gather together to worship the Lord, a day that we spend with the Lord. We know that Jesus observed the Sabbath. I mean, He did that to fulfill righteousness for us, but He also did it as an example for us. He declared Himself to be the Lord of the Sabbath. He told His disciples how they should keep it, what the right way is, and then He told them that they were to take the things that He had taught them and teach them to the nations. Jesus told His disciples that they would continue to observe the Sabbath even after the new covenant was fully established after he had died and risen and ascended into heaven. Remember he said with regard to AD 70 in the Olivet Discourse, pray that your flight out of Jerusalem would not be on a Sabbath day. The author to the Hebrews said that far from abolishing the Sabbath through the work that Jesus did, he actually laid the foundation for that day to continue. Hebrews chapter 4 verses 9 through 10. Therefore, there remains a Sabbath day for the people of God because the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. Speaking about Jesus completing the work of the new creation and entering into his rest. We looked at, in a, you know, at objections to the Sabbath, uh, the two main ones, the, the two passages that are usually quoted to prove that the Sabbath doesn't continue in the, the new covenant. And we saw that they really weren't addressing the weekly moral Sabbath, but rather the ceremonial Sabbaths, of which there were many, that were attached to the feast days in the Old Testament. Those days, Paul tells us, were free to observe or not observe, uh, according to Christian liberty. But that doesn't apply to any of the commandments of God. Those we need to keep. They're not optional. Finally, we considered that the day, uh, the day in which we are to keep it, that the commandment itself does not really specify a particular day, but rather a frequency of days, work six days and rest on the seventh, and a duration of time that we are to spend with him, keep the whole day holy. So the day needs to be determined from outside of the commandment itself. Now originally it commemorated God's rest from the work of the old creation and so it was observed on Saturday. That's when the Jews observed it at least until the time they entered into Egypt. But when sin destroyed the creation, you know, not absolutely, but I mean, the marks of the curse are all around us. And Jesus brought in the new creation through his work. It now commemorates, that is, the Sabbath, now commemorates the day on which he rested when he entered into his rest. For the one who has entered into his rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. That was referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. The day he entered into his rest was the first day of the week, and so the Sabbath is now observed on Sunday. This is where, what we saw the early church doing, and this is why in Scripture there is a particular day that is called the Lord's Day. That's the day that John received the revelation, remember, in Revelation chapter 1. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day refers to the day that Jesus rose from the dead, the day on which the church would worship. Now, that's all the review, okay? And I reviewed it because now we're going to shift gears and we're going to go into how we are to keep this day holy. And before we do that, I just want to make sure we understand that this day is a blessing, okay? We need to see it as something good that God has given to us uh, and not as a burden because it shouldn't be a burden to us. It should be a delight to us because of what we get to do on this day and the freedom that God gives us to do it, freedom from other things that would drag us away that are infinitely less important. Okay, so as we begin uh, to look at how we are to keep the Sabbath and again what God tells us we should and shouldn't do on this day, the first thing we need to do is to guard ourselves against basically you know, reacting negatively you know, to this commandment. And really, I do think a lot of Christians, professing Christians, actually do react negatively 
because they see it as a day in which they don't get to do certain things. But I want us to see we don't get to do those things so that we can do better things. Now, we know that our society is steeped in autonomy. Autonomy is a fancy word for saying that we think we should be able to make our own rules and chart our own course, you know, that we you know, basically want to do what we want to do. And this attitude has affected us. We don't like to be told what we should do. Now, this problem isn't really because of the society that we were that raised in. You know, that was the mistake Karl Marx made when he said that, you know, we'd all be perfect if we were, grew up in a utopia. And no matter how good the society is, people are still the same way. The problem is we are this way because of sin, because of, of this corruption that's in our hearts that's um, you know, that comes about because of the fall, the, the, really the absence of the presence of the Holy Spirit as we come into, the world, into this world. That's what Adam and Eve lost and why they felt naked and exposed in the garden. Now, without that righteousness, all we're left with is sin, and sin by its own nature is really selfishness. That's what we were when we came into this world, selfish and self-seeking, and as a part of that, we didn't want authority getting in our way. I mean, why is it that people don't like the commandments or any kind of commandments, any kind of a stipulation? Don't walk on the grass. Don't touch the wet paint. We don't like to be told, you know, what not to do. And we know that even after the Lord has mercy on us and He changes our hearts by the Holy Spirit, gives us a new heart, we still struggle with these things, with, with this sin, because it's not all gone. It's still there. The old man, our flesh, is fighting against the new nature. Paul writes, so that we may not do the things that we want to do. I mean, if we love the Lord, we want to live a life that's perfect, don't we? But we can't live that kind of a life, and the reason we can't is because of the sin and selfishness within us. So I'm, I'm saying by this, we simply need to be careful how we respond to God's authority that we don't let our sin react against it. Now, we need to remember He has the right to command us. That's another thing that's kind of lost in the church today. There, there are commandments. You know, some churches believe there aren't. But yes, there are things we must do. God has given to us ten commandments, and they're not ten suggestions. And we need to obey them. And again, remember, we don't obey them in order to save ourselves. That's legalism, right? We obey them to please God because that's what He loves. He loves what's right. And these commandments are what's right. Okay? Now, we need to remember at the same time that, that though God gives us these commandments, He's also done three things that will make it easier for us to keep these. First of all, He's given us His Son. Right? He's given us His Son to show us how to keep them. And by the way, Jesus' life is characterized as a life of love towards the Father and towards His neighbor. Jesus' life is characterized by love. But how did Jesus live? He lived according to the commandments. So the connection, remember again, is the commandments tell us how to love. Jesus lived according to the law of love. So He gave us His Son as an example. He also gave us His Son to free us from guilt, so the guilt of having broken the law of love so that we don't you know, go down into hell forever when we die, but also to break the power of sin in our hearts. Now that, all of these things that Jesus has done for us, I mean, how would you place a value on that? How much is that worth? That's worth more than we can possibly imagine. And having given us such a precious gift as this, first of all, should make us thankful. We owe the Lord a debt of gratitude. Secondly, he broke the power of sin by giving us his Holy Spirit. Remember, Jesus came into the world to do the work that he, he, done, he had, well, that he's done, remove our guilt, but also that he might give us the Holy Spirit so that by his presence in our hearts, we would want to keep the commandments. What the Spirit of God does is he opens our eyes to see the beauty of the commandments, that they really are good. I mean, which one of the commandments would you point to and say, I don't want to do that because it isn't good? All of these things are good. They're good in loving God, good in loving our neighbor. So again, the fact that he's given us the Holy Spirit is another infinitely precious gift that 
finds us or should make us want to obey the Lord. And thirdly, as I've said, the Spirit helps us to see just how good these things really are, that God actually gave them for our good. Whatever God commands us really helps us in some way. Not only helps our neighbor, but it also helps us. And that's why Luther in his sort of, um, how would you say, uh, picturesque way could write this. If the Lord told me to eat the dung on the street, I would eat it and know that it was good for me. You see, only Luther could say something like that. <laughs> but you see, the point Luther's making here is what God would never tell us to do that because He knows it's not good for us. But if He told us to do that, it must mean that it's good for us, okay? So that's why Luther, using this kind of graphic imagery, would say something like that. But that's how we need to understand what God calls us to do. Now, we may not always fully understand that at the time, especially when we're new Christians, that what he tells me to do here is good. Sometimes we think it's, it's restricting us in some way or keeping us from some pleasures that we should have. But I think we understand as we walk with the Lord in the Christian life, the more we keep the commandments, and maybe more particularly, the more we break them, we begin to see just how these commandments are good and how good they really are and how it protects us from evil. Do not lead us into temptation, Jesus uh, told the disciples to pray, but deliver us from evil. Well, how do you determine what temptation is? How do you determine what evil is? Well, you have to bring it to the touchstone of God's commandments because they are the standard of what is good. Now, all of this is also true of the Sabbath. Okay, God gave it to us because it is good. He gave it to us for our good. So I want us just to consider, secondly, why it's good. You know, Moses <clears throat> said to the Israelites just before they entered into the promised land and after the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, he said to the second generation, as he repeated, just finished repeating the Ten Commandments to them. This is what he says in Deuteronomy 6, verses 1 through 3. Now, this is the commandment, the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it, so that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God, to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you all the days of your life and that your days may be prolonged. Notice, first of all, longer life. You know, we, we see Paul in the New Testament basically saying the same thing, children, obey your parents in the Lord, which is the first commandment with the promise that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. The, the, there's a blessing that's attached to obedience. But then he goes on to say this, O oh, Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. We need to understand there's a reason behind why God gives commandments to His people, and the reason is that it might be well with them, that they might be blessed, that they might have what they need, that they might live a long life and, and live, if the Lord is willing, a healthy life. That is also why He gave us His Sabbath, that it might be well with us. Now again, it may not appear so at first glance. There may be some things about it that we don't like. I mean, we may not like the idea that we can't work on this day. I don't know, a lot of people don't like to work, so maybe that's not a problem. But there's people who really get into their employment, right? And they just can't seem to give it up. And that's what the Lord is, first of all, telling us. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Basically, all your vocational work, what you do to take care of your needs. But the seventh day is a Sabbath. That's a day of rest. Don't work on this day. So God gives us six days in which to get all of that done, and He tells us to rest on the seventh. In it you shall not do any work. Now, there are exceptions as we'll see this evening okay, as, we, as we look further at this. Now, we may also not like the fact that as, as we probe a little bit more deeply into this commandment, and this is, I'm really stepping on toes here, that we are not to participate on this day in what 
the confession calls worldly recreations. And that means sporting events, things like that, that you're either involved in or watching that are tied to this world. There are recreational things. There are exceptions to this, as we'll see, uh, as we get into that a little bit later, not, not this morning, that really do recreate you, that refresh you. But the things that are tied to this world, they're excluded by the fact that we are to keep this day holy. Okay? So what does that mean? Well, it means that, and again, you may not like this, but it means that the Lord tells us we shouldn't be watching the Olympics today. And I believe the Super Bowl is today. I looked it up. I think it's today. I'm not necessarily a, a football fan, so it doesn't, I don't have to struggle in this area. But there's going to be a lot of people today, even churches that will drop a big screen, bigger than this one, and instead of worshiping, they'll replace the worship service with a Super Bowl Sunday, okay? Where they're not worshiping the Lord. They're not focusing on the Lord. They're not keeping the day holy, okay? But again, I want you to see that this is what it means to keep the day holy. What does holy mean? Well, it means to set apart. God sets apart this day for himself. You know, objects in the Old Covenant, we, we don't have holy objects in the New Covenant. I mean, these things are holy. This building isn't holy. But in the Old Covenant, there were things that were holy. And if you messed with those things, God got angry at you, okay? Remember when uh, Bel Belshazzar takes the holy vessels out of the temple that had been taken from Jerusalem and he decides to use them in his party and how the Lord causes a hand to write on the wall basically saying, your goose is cooked, okay? Well, that's because he was using something holy for something unholy. Even if he had used it for common use, that, that wouldn't have been acceptable because something that is holy is set apart for, to God to be used exclusively for his purposes. People who are holy means that they are set apart from the people of the world and they belong to God, okay? We belong to him. We are holy people. When God calls this day holy and he calls us to keep this day holy, what he means is we are to separate this day from the other things that we are doing during the week, not just part of it, but the whole of it, the whole of this day, separate it to him. This day belongs to him and we are to spend this day with him. So that's why he calls us to set, apart our, set aside our work and to set aside our play so that we can do this. You know, we have to do, set these things aside so that we can do what he actually calls us to do, so that we can spend the day with him and with his people. Now, I should stop right there and say, take a look at your heart. How do you feel about that? You know, do you like that? Is that something that's, that's acceptable to you? You say, yeah, you know, sign me up. I want to do that now. Or are you thinking, gosh, I don't know if I really want to spend a whole day with him. The Super Bowl is today after all, and I'd rather watch the Super Bowl. But again, think about what our hearts should be, okay? Because this is, a, I, I, I've said before, the Sabbath is like a, like a thermometer. It kind of takes our spiritual temperature, is it, does it show that we're cold? Or does it show that we're, that we're hot? Okay. Now, if our hearts are where they should be, we should see this as a blessing and not as a burden. Because what is this except the, the logical outworking of the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me? What does that mean? It means love God most of all. Remember when Jesus asked about what was the greatest commandment in, in the law? He says, the foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Well, you see, if the Spirit of God has, has given us the new birth, if He's working within our lives, then we should want to keep the Sabbath because on this day, we get to spend it with the one whom we love most of all. I mean, who wouldn't want a day with the person that you love most uh, above everyone else. Now, our desire to do this, we know, is compromised by the fact that we still have flesh, right? We still have that sin. But it will be there, and to some degree, because of the Spirit's work within our hearts, we will have this desire to spend time with God. And the more we love Him, the more we're going to want to spend with him. The more we love him, the more it's going to trouble us that we just don't get enough time with him, right? 
Now, we know that from the very beginning, God has made this world in such a way that there are other things that we have to do. You know, we, we have work to do. We have to work for the things we need to live. We need to work for our daily bread. This was true at the very beginning. You know, Adam and Eve were not just in a paradise where the, I mean, they were in a paradise, but the plants didn't just bear fruit without any, any cultivation. They needed to cultivate them, those plants then, just as we need to now. They had to do work, so they were created to work. And God actually gave them a, a very large work to do. He said, be fruitful and multiply. Okay, have children. Fill the earth and subdue it. Okay, subduing the earth, how much work is that? Well, that's a lot of work. We're still doing it today. The fact that we have all these electronics and other things that are going on here, those, that comes from subduing the earth. Well, so work was instituted from the very beginning, and work takes time, whether we do it in the home or outside of the home. Having a family, especially a large family, that, that means certain responsibilities and those relationships, and those all take time. Recreation, which is not a bad thing, you know, just certain types on the Lord's Day. Recreation is something we also need to do during the week because if we don't, we'll probably go crazy from our responsibilities. We do need to take a break. But all these things take time. And these things could eat up all of our time if we let them. But God's not going to let them. God's given us a commandment. Now, we also have to deal with our sin. Remember, our sin is also going to keep us from actually spending the time with the Lord that we need to during the week. Well, the Sabbath is a blessing because it gives us time. It's a commandment from God to take time, the time that we need in order to spend with Him, in order to cultivate that relationship with Him. The Sabbath is a blessing because it frees us from guilt. It frees us from the guilt of setting all these other things aside, you know, those housing projects, that maintenance of the landscape, that work that you might have to do that's left over from the office. Uh, you don't have to feel guilty that you've set that aside because when you do, you know you're simply doing what God wants you to do. How can you feel guilty if you're doing what God wants you to do? It's a blessing because even though we may think that we need to do that work on the Sabbath, on, on the Lord's Day, or that we need to, you know, engage in certain types of recreation, even to survive. Some people do. I think it's a matter of death or you know, life or death. God will make sure that we don't lose anything, but gain something that is much more precious. Again, think about what Jesus must have meant when he said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Okay, that means put God, his will, his kingdom first in your hearts and in your lives. And then he says, and all these things, everything that people are concerned about, food, clothing, everything, all these things will be added to you. You know, God will not only bless us by, by providing what we need physically, he will also bless us spiritually. And here's where the greatest blessing comes. We'll have a closer relationship with him. We'll have greater power and boldness to live for him. And that will give us a greater ability to serve Him. And that service will also result in greater rewards. You know, the Bible does say there are degrees of reward in heaven. Not everybody's going to get the same thing. Those who have sacrificed more and served the Lord more are going to have higher honor. And those who've done less will have less. But everybody's going to be perfectly happy. I mean, nobody's going to you know, feel uh, like they've been shorted. We're all just happy to be there. We're all going to be filled with, with love and peace and joy, but there are places of honor, as our Lord tells us. Remember James and John had their mother ask Jesus for those places, and he said, wait a minute, are you, are you able to go through what I'm going to go through? Because that's what you would need to sit at my right and left hand. Well, yeah, we can, all right, so you'll, you'll get a taste of that. But no, those two places are not, you know, not for you, but they're for the one my heavenly Father has chosen or those whom he's chosen. There are places of honor in heaven. So as we have greater power to serve the Lord, we will also have greater rewards. Now, Jonathan Edwards reminds us of this. And I, again, when you find a, a gem like this, you want to repeat it several times because we forget. He says, it doesn't really matter who prospers in this world. 
because, you know, in his days, people only lived into their 30s. He lived into his 50s. There were people who lived into their 80s, maybe older, but most, if, if you didn't die at birth or in your infancy, 50% of the children did then you might expect to survive into your 30s, okay? But even if you could live to be 900, maybe 1,000, it still wouldn't matter. It doesn't really matter who prospers here below because that's only a very brief time. What really matters is who prospers in the eternal state. That is, that condition we're going to be in in heaven or in the new heavens and the new earth that's going to go on forever and ever. So how do you compare a thousand years with eternity? See, you can see the comparison. We need to use this time to basically store up those rewards. Jesus said, don't, don't store up treasures on earth where thieves can break in and steal and you know, moth and, and you know, rust corrupt, but lay up your treasures in heaven where those things can't be corrupted and nobody can take them away from you and we can add to that, you get to enjoy them forever and ever. And I don't think it's like a palace made of gold. I think it's more along the lines of honors and maybe, as some of the Puritans said, the ability to enjoy God more, to be, have a larger vessel, as it were, a larger capacity to be filled with love and joy, and yet everyone is filled to the rim. Their vessels are all filled. Okay. So thinking of that, we, we should really be thinking about how we might best use the few years that we have in this world to make things better there. Well, to do that, we need more spiritual strength. And in order to have spiritual strength, we need to spend time with the Lord. We need to spend time with Him. Again, how often do we think about, I have a relationship with God. And I need to, div uh, to uh, cultivate that relationship. I need to make that stronger. I, I need to draw nearer to Him. How often do we think about that? Well, you know, how many people do you have relationships with that you never spend time with? You know, those relationships aren't, t aren't going to tend to be quite as strong. Now, they might be if you spend a lot of time with them in the past. And we know that um, people like that, when you don't spend time with them for a long time, they, you tend to get caught up really quickly because you've already developed this relationship. But I think our relationships that we have right now, we, we understand to make them strong, we need to spend time with each other. Well, the same thing is true with God. We need to spend time with Him. And that is why He gave us this commandment. That's why it's a blessing. It gives us time with Him. So the encouragement is let's not give this time away by spending it with other things that are infinitely less important. Let's spend the time with God. Now, there's a lot more that needs to be said, and this evening we're going to look more carefully at what the command requires regarding work in particular. But I said there's exceptions. We want to see what those exceptions are. It's not that we can't do any work. There are certain things that we need to do on this day, and if we didn't, it would be a crime or a sin not to do them. Well, with that in mind, let's just bow in a moment of prayer and um, let's not only ask the Lord to help us to see this day as a blessing and to begin to in, use it in the way He intends us to use it, but let's also ask the Lord to prepare us to come to the table. Uh, let's deal with any sins we need to repent of and renew our commitment to love and follow Him.